express my deepest gratitude to the Man Smith Innovation Awards Organizing Committee for this honor and recognition. This recognition is not just about me as an individual, but rather a tribute to our incredible team who have worked relentlessly to make the Primer Group what it is today. The Primer Group have humble beginning nearly four decades ago. In a couple of years, we will be celebrating our 40th anniversary. For 40 years, we have brought the world closer to our customers, representing global lifestyle brands, not just in the Philippines, but across Southeast Asia. Our store have served your innovative products and brands that have been your companion on every journey, throughout every adventure, and every step of the way. Our first store was a small counter in Landmark, selling our first brand of luggage during a challenging period in our history. That was during the Kurita years. Today, the Primer Group has close to 400 store and subsidiaries in 10 countries, representing over 100 brands and owning six global brands. Like any other entrepreneur, we had dreams and visions for our business. However, in the beginning, I have to admit that our dreams did not extend beyond the Philippines, nor do we have owned a global trademark. Things were going well. We were smooth sailing on a calm sea. Our store lead, one store leads to another, one brand leads to another, until we saw two big waves coming. The first wave represented the rea realization that the local market in the Philippines during a rough period was making us vulnerable. Again, this is reflections during the coup retire and all the catastrophic. Our representation of non-essential categories and limited local demand for our products presented a restricting future that is challenging for us to navigate. The second wave is the vulnerability of a local retailers and distributors like us selling global brands in the local markets. We are essentially a middleman. We don't own the brands. No matter how much hard investment we pour in, in the end, we find ourselves at the mercy of our principal, the brand owner. If we do well, it's easily for them to take over the market. And if we don't perform, it would be easily taken away from us. Damn if you do, damn if you don't. Although we are proud to have a nurtured and enjoyed decades of relationship with our principal, our Achilles heel as a distributor cannot be hidden. And we experience this re reality several times in our business, meaning we lose brands after nurturing so many years of brand. But instead of dwelling in the gloomy wave that could drown us, we choose to see it as a force that could lead us to new opportunities. Our Asian neighbors began to look more attractive as a market, and the opportunity to expand beyond the Philippines become clearer as this wave pushes us. The wave also allow us to question our business model and ultimately our destiny. We saw the opportunity and built acquired brands that we can grow within our expanded ecosystem. Hence, we formed AeroWorks, our tech and digital e-commerce arm that allow us to build our next generation's platform and capability in the digital era. Then we have DigiWorks, our homegrown creative agency that provides 360 degree marketing energy for our brands and businesses, followed by Primer Distribution Center, our logistic and fulfillment unit that is designed and built to the next generation supply chain solution. Riding your first wave can be simultaneously scary and exciting. My partners and I, with sheer grit and determination, decided to take the chance and plant the seeds in Singapore and Malaysia, and eventually in the rest of Asia. We also built and scaled across the region our proprietary concept store. In addition, we acquired global brands to be part of our portfolio. We acquired a Singapore brand, World Traveler, 
a French brand, Sledger's Footwear, Flight One from New York, Polar Outdoor from Portland, MRKT bags from Shanghai, and Free Waters Footwear from the US. It was as scary and as exciting as it could be, action-packed and captivating at the same time. But we don't ride this wave alone. We were fortunate to have friends, Gary and Jeff, which are down there on Octagarian. They're both 85 years old. Uh, my first association with them was more than 30 years ago. Patiently, they handhold us. Uh, both are Singaporean and Malaysian, respectively. Handhold us during our, infor our, our formative stage of our business. They are not only our mentors, but they also become, eventually becomes our partners. They guided, uh, they guided us through the turbulent waters in the business world. Riding the wave is not easy, and it's not something you can master on your first try. We fail numerous times, but with each fall, we learn and improve. Soon, we were able to stand the entire ride. To succeed, we focused on executing our strategies. First, restructure our business model to adapt to the unique and diverse ASEAN market, ensuring our approach can cater to all the varying needs of each region. Next, we carefully selected the right talent and partners who shared the same culture and values as ours. And perhaps the most important, we learned to soak like a sponge. We learn from our mentors, from our principals, from our competitors, from our customers, from our success, and above all, from our failures. Before I conclude, I'd like to leave you with some valuable lessons from our journey. When you see a wave, do not run from it, ride it. Look for a mentor and a partner. You will surely fall many times before you can ride. Lastly, Dream a big dreams, that's not enough for just one generation. This is a reminder that the journey you have done is not limited to your, to your generations alone. Your legacy can continue through the efforts of future generations. Empower those who will follow your footsteps and enable them to build on what you have started. Your triumphs and lessons are stepping stones for them to carve their own path. It paves the way for them to redefine their own success and create their own narrative that reflects their generation. Your influence will ripple through time, inspire a new era to dare to go beyond their dreams. These are the lessons that we can draw from our journey at the Primer Group. It has guided us, transformed us to do our business, starting from just a small trading company and now we are embracing waves and continue to mark our footprint in the industry. Again, I'd like to thank everyone who has been part of this journey for this award. Our experience at Primary Group is a testament that we can achieve when you choose to ride the wave. No matter how daunting it may seem, you can reach greater heights if you are relentless in the pursuit of your success. Thank you and a pleasant afternoon to everyone. Um, and, and speaking of partners, no, I mean, uh, and happy to mind because part of growing the company is, like you said, it's a collaborative effort. Yes, indeed, and to stay indeed. together over the five years, because I've had partners where sometimes the relationship partners for forty years. For forty years, sometimes partnerships work, partnerships don't work, and in, in many businesses. Exactly. And you know, and like they said, there's always an air, there's always an, a collaboration that needs to be done. How do you, over the years, manage having being five partners and still staying together through the rough waves and the, and the calm yeah, waves? Yeah, I think, I think for primaries, it's very unique. Uh, there's a lot of success companies, you know. But I, I, I believe, personally, uh, our advocacy of uh, Primer is we want to ensure, you know, that partnership, uh, you work business with your friends, with your family still can work because there's, you know, uh, there's a lot of saying, you know, you want to f stay, maintain your friends and partners, never go to business together. Yes, and yes, I, exactly. And I think, I think we've proven that it still works. And I, I think the key here, the key here is uh, being collaborative is, uh, we, we, we all realized at the very beginning that the five of us have different talents, have a different skill, they have a different strength and weaknesses. And we just work 
capitalize our weakness, our, our strength, and for those shortfalls, we don't blame each others. You know, I think that's the been the been the mantra for the last 40 years. That's why we keep this kind of uh, uh, partnership and a very strong foundation of friendship. Got that. Now, um, interestingly enough, if we, let's, let's try to apply uh, Josiah's four-step innovation yeah. process over here because I think it, it, it works very well here in this scenario. The first one is the idea of challenging assumption because like you said, you began as just a technically a small stall Trading redistributing, company, yeah. uh, redistributing luggage. Um, help us better understand, when did you start challenging the assumption that this is not enough just to be the distributor of the product? What, what, was there something that happened where uh, the middleman, where you, where you were pulled out as a middleman, which you said, okay, I think we have to move up in the, in the yeah, value yeah, chain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's a sequence of what transpired in, in, you know, in the last 40 years. Of course, we have a one first brand. We lost the brand. Uh, we lost that brand. You Between know. brands, I know, it's a landmark. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. But prior to that one, we already know the fate, the destiny of a middleman or of a distribution because it's all about the start of globalization. The start of the globalization, we know how, direct, uh, how each principal brand owner go directly to the market. And that's where we started to build our concept store. Yeah, you, you, I mean, just example this luggage brand. You may be taken away from us and do it, but you still need our footprint of retail chain. So that's how we evolve, you know. And um, yeah, I think I think for, um, and of course we started working on the value chain. Then we, of course, at that time, as I mentioned, why we start looking beyond the Philippines market because the Philippines only the last maybe last two decades that we have more steady of uh, GDP growth. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, we're being you know up, up and, and down, down, up and down, and, down. Mm -hmm. and we're saying it's very difficult to survive this kind of environment. And at that time, we already I'm already exposed on uh, the, our neighboring country in Singapore, and Malaysia, event, uh, which I am exposed to the two mentors. I'm seeing. What's a, what sort of a middle class society, you know? I see. Yeah, oh. and that's exactly where I say, okay, um, if we just want to be, a, I mean, to sustain a, a, this, this middle class market of uh, our merchandises, we have to look beyond the Philippines and look at ASEAN as one, one, one market. Yeah. Having said that, I'm very interested. When you came, what was the name of the first concept store again? Travel Club. A travel Club. When you came up with that, the idea for me is like sort of like uh, it's like it's like happy to face the in the sense that yeah. But here, I, I have the I have the footprint or I have the product, but I need to get I need to get I, I have the technology, but now I need to put the product inside. Yeah, I think I think it's two two things that compel us, and I think it's something that uh, you look at uh, is there a market or are you just much uh, much ahead, you know? When when we build Travel Club, people are saying. I mean, people doesn't travel, they doesn't need a, tr a, a luggage, they just have to borrow, you know. Mm -hmm, that's right. And secondly, another innovate, I mean, another very bold of what we did is the ROX, Recreational Outdoor Exchange, because uh, we, we are urban people, you know, and who, you know, we are urban people, uh, who's going to buy a thick North Face or a thick Columbia? But our, 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 at that time, we are in also in about trying to change the lifestyle of the people because our, the lifestyle of the people at that time, when they go just gimmicking on nighttime, and of course at that time we want to shift, you know, uh, uh, more of a what can you do in the morning or wake up in the early, uh, wake up in six o'clock rather than go go home in six o'clock, you know. So and of course that's also the time that we uh, uh, the, where the climate change and the environment is becoming very uh, quite of a key buzzword. And that's also compelled us, okay, maybe this is space also. You know? So that's also that we push the outdoor. And right now, outdoor is becoming major, major wow. lifestyle, not in the Philippines, but entire Southeast Asia. So th there's, there's a travel club in ROX also, not just in the Philippines, but in other, con yeah, in other yeah, countries yeah. there also. Yeah. Uh, and when you developed the concept for this one, basically, because you understood the retail game and, and the commercial space game, you were also sort of distributing multiple products, but under your, under your concept store, is that right? Both concept store and uh, mono brand store, and mono brand yeah. store at the same time. So, what quite quite an innovation! You you came in not just to you were not just developing stores, but you were developing innovative stores which which were which had the yeah exactly. Uh, we're in because because as you know, as a retailer, you have the touch point of the consumer, mm -hmm. you know, and of course, especially nowadays with data, so much it's so much talk about data as a new currency. So we take advantage of our cost uh, CRM, you know, we monitor what's their behavior, what's their pattern. Uh, what's the threshold of spending and where, how often do they spend? So we capitalize those data and that would also determine us. Uh, that of course, in, in co couple of what we're reading from the research was the new trend. And uh, recently, we're going uh, to launch and uh, 
uh, introduce a new concept which is about wellness. Wellness, yeah, now. wellness, and that's what you're seeing as a new trend. Wellness is yeah, a yeah, yeah, because we're seeing the, uh, the the it's a new concept or it's a new trend that the young uh, young consumers is you know is becoming a part of their lifestyle. Very interesting. So from the concept store, eventually that's when you started to acquire a global brand. When did you start deciding that it was a pain point that you had to, or there was an opportunity to move up in the in the in the value chain that you had yeah, to develop you, to, you, to acquire uh, brands? Yeah, as a as a middle man, as a distributor, we, when we nurture a brand from nothing, emerging brand, when we build a certain market shares, which is really, there's a scale for the brand owner to take over. So we lost those brands, and then we decide, and then we, it reflect, we reduce some reflections. When we choose brand among the primer, we always choose emerging brand rather than mainstream brand, because we, are, we, are, we believe our capabilities of brand building, and because we also have the infrastructure to build that up. So when we look at it, say, okay, why not we just, when we try to see brands that we, an emerging brand, if you want to, want to cultivate and nurture it, why not as well, Go, I mean, entry, you know, just like the stock market, it's well, it's still low. We start acquiring, and that's how we, how we rationalize ourselves and how we pick the brands. I mean, for me, that's another innovative thing that instead of just uh, creating your own brand, you just bought brands which are already yeah, emerging. Yeah, bought the brands that we, be, because I bought the brands that we intend to grow in our market. Yeah. And, and these, these brands which you, which you brought in house, um, how did you identify that these would be the brands that, that would be best to fit your, uh, I guess? Ba based on the consumer's profile we have and the, bros and the data that we normally look at, I mean, how the, uh, the pattern of these kind of consumers. And the other innovation which I, which I saw really was both the development of AeroWorks and DigiWorks. Yeah. Because uh, for me, you couldn't have done that without having that sort of uh, infrastructure within the company to, to create that. The, 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 the ecosystem that we built, we built is really to, you know, for us to fast track, um, fast track our business, you know, our business unit to be more agile and to be more adaptable because they don't have to worry the back end, you know, because at the end of the, end of the day, you, you can drive your business, but you still have your shared service, then you still have your warehousing, you still have your marketing. So we built that a completely a shared service that, you, that, can be a, that can service any type of industry. Got that, got that. And sir, what, what I found very interesting, two, two more things about your discussion was number one, the idea of, of mentorship, which for you was very, very key uh, in terms of growth. And for many of us who are growing our companies or who have companies but are looking for mentors, how should you select, I guess, or how, how do you know who best to, to mentor the company? Uh, for, for, first of all, you, we, we, you know, we have to create an environment, we have to create an environment of psychological safety. You know, everybody can speak of, you know. And even you speak of, you're not afraid to be shoot down. And I mean, that's what we're encouraged in our, in our environment. Everybody can shoot off. And of course, you can see from there on who are the ones who be bold, bold and who are really not only bold, but can really execute. So that's where we identify those, we, so, we call it so-called high potentials. And that's uh, now, especially right now in our crossroads, we are already in the ge generational succession and where the next generation, uh, the second gen and the new gen of management is coming in. And that's where we are now reinforcing uh, this mentorship program. Within the company, within private. Within the company. Oh. And, and then lastly, um, which I'm very interested about, especially here in the Philippines, is that the importance of accepting failure for companies. Because some companies, you know, the culture is not there for failure. But here you kept on saying you had to fail. But where did the failure that you had become one of the best innovations you've ever had for uh, the company? I, I think, no, of course, right now people just see us as our success story. But you can imagine what, how much of failures we've been through. Oh. You know? <laughs> how much failures we've been through. In fact, uh, in, in, even in our organization, some of the board is already saying, hey, Jim, you're doing too much experiment already. <laughs> you know? But yeah, I, I think, I think uh, that's, that's why you have to have a balance. You know, to have mm -hmm. a balance. And to, to keep that discipline, uh, as I also explained, now we have external, external advisor and external independent director to, to set that discipline for us. Sort of, like I said, the word was fiscalized to make sure that yeah, the balance Exactly. of what you're doing. Exactly. exactly. Uh, but, but in your in your own opinion or what happened in your experience, maybe you could share a story where the failure became one of the best, you know, the learnings you got became one of the best, I guess, product or service innovations which emerged from Primer. I, I, I think uh, the the one that we had is, uh, you know, uh, when we jumped to uh, one of the category that we haven't mastered enough and we just jumped by sheer by sure in faith or sure intuition. Uh -oh. And this is basically a child category. Children child, child, children child category, yeah, yeah. okay. So when we realize we don't have enough data understanding the, this, this category, uh, but uh, I think that's, that's 
give us a post that before you do anything, you should have uh, at least you know do some research and all this thing. Yeah, we, we, we failed tremendously when we are still a licensee of Disney. Yeah, it's a it's a more of a kids category. Yeah. And then what did you what 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 did you gain from that insight from that failure that it was able to improve business uh, moving yeah, forward? I think, I think as a beginner, as a uh, as an entrepreneur, you just rely on you know rely on intuition. And through the years, you have this experience, wisdom. And nowadays, I think believe I, I'm a strong believer of data. You know, and I think with the next generations, I challenge them. You know, uh, you know, you you try to capitalize the data and the technology, which is not re really available on our part. The time, during our time. That's right. And to run things off, uh, talking about data, no? just as we go on, what are you doing right now in the company for you know, data analytics to make sure that it comes it, to... It's still, it's still a very infant stage, uh, which I'm encouraging our team right now, even come with a proposal. Uh, I mean, if you have to proposal, you have to ensure there's enough data. But, but it doesn't mean once you have data, because data can be interpreted differently by each individual, you know. So that's where we have this uh, this uh, environment about uh, psychological safety. You you defend your case, and of course we also apply our co our. I mean, what lasted the 40 years we had is we deliberate, we debate. Whatever decisions come out, there's no fault finding. Just you know, just support whatever decisions have been made. I like that advice again. A round of a round of applause, please. Thank you so much, Jimmy El Tai.